Hey, did you have a good day? It was all right. I battled with maths today. Hmm? We started a new section with lines, shapes and angles on the Cartesian plane. I really don't know what I'm doing. Could you please help me? Of course I can. Let me have a look at your school book. Sure. All right, to start with, do you see that telephone pole over there? Can you see that it has cables that hold it firmly in the ground? Where these cables are pegged is very important. Do you think they should be pegged close to the base of the pole like this? Or would you peg them further away from the pole? You can see that an angle is formed between the ground and each of the cables. These angles change depending on where the cables are pegged into the ground. When a telephone pole is installed, the workers are given specific instructions about how big the angles must be. The cables need to be far enough from the pole to give it the support it needs. We call this angle the angle of inclination. Another name for a slope is an incline, so it makes sense that the steepness or gradient of a slope can be described by the angle of the inclination. I think we should look at straight lines today. Their gradients, their angle of inclination, the form with the x-axis. You have worked with straight line graphs before, but now we want to use them in the coordinate geometry. Let's go inside. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to work out the equation of a straight line passing through two given points, and you should be able to calculate the inclination of a straight line. Here's something to think about. Here's the point minus 2, minus 5. How many lines can be drawn through this single point on the Cartesian plane? I think you can draw one straight up and one straight across. Then you can do one at an angle. Actually, I think we can have millions of lines going through this point. You're right. You can have an infinite number of lines passing through any point on the plane. Now the next thing to consider is, if you have two points, how many different straight lines can be drawn through them? Let's see. I can only imagine one straight line ever joining two points. Right again. There's only one way of joining two points if you're considering straight lines only. This is really useful when you want to find the equation of a straight line. I don't see what you're getting at. We've seen that a straight line is determined by any two points that it passes through. These two points can help us to describe any specific line using an equation. I'm sure you remember that. A straight line graph has the formula y equals m times x plus c. Sure. I also remember that the m was for gradient. Yes. But what is gradient and how do you calculate it? I think the gradient of the line tells us how steep it is. And you find the gradient by seeing how much you move up this way compared to how much you move across this way. Well done, Gerard. We can calculate the gradient of a line between two points by working out the distance we've moved between the two points. Let me show you how. Looking at the y values of each point, we move from minus 5 at this point to 7 at this point. Then looking at the x values of each point, we move from minus 2 at this point to 3 at this point. The amount we move this way, vertically, divided by the amount we have moved horizontally gives us the slope or gradient of the line. This distance between the y values is y2 minus y1. The distance between the x values is x2 minus x1. The formula for calculating the gradient of a straight line is m is equal to y2 minus y1 all divided by x2 minus x1. y2 minus y1 is the change in the y values. The x2 minus the x1 is the change in the x values.
So let's get back to the equation that describes any straight line, y equals mx plus c. What do we know about the c value in this formula? The c value was the same number as the y-intercept on the graph. That's it. So now that we have all these facts in front of us, is there a way to find the equation of the specific line? I guess we must use y equals mx plus c. Right again. Every straight line has the formula of form y equals mx plus c. But for any specific line, the x values and the y values are changing all along the line. The gradient is constant, so the m value is constant. And there's only one y-intercept, so the c value is constant. So, to find the equation of a line, we must find out what the constant values for m and c are. How do you think we can find the m and the c for this line? Surely we can find the m using the formula for gradient? Right. It also helps to start by labeling the coordinates so that you don't get mixed up. Let's use x1 and y1 for this point, and this point will be x2 and y2. OK, so I can substitute into the formula. y2 is 7, and y1 is minus 5. Then x2 is 3, and x1 is minus 2. Remember to use brackets so that you don't make mistakes with the plus and minus signs. Thanks. So I get 7 plus 5 divided by 3 plus 2. That means the gradient is 12 divided by 5. Excellent. You use the formula to find the gradient, but there's another method you could use. You can read the gradient of the graph. Are you saying I can find my gradient without writing my formula down? Yes. Take the example we just looked at. What is the difference between the y values of the two points? 1, 2, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12. 12 units. And the difference between the x values of the two points? That is 1, 2, 3, 5 units. Therefore, the gradient is 12 divided by 5. That looks a lot easier, but I guess we're doing the same thing as we did with the formula. Right, and sometimes you can use the formula if you can't read the points of the graph easily. This gradient is positive because as we move from left to right, the y values increase. You might like to think of it as going uphill. So now that we know the gradient of this line, what do we do with this information? I guess we can put it into the equation. So for this line, y, is 12 divided by 5x plus c. But how do we find the c value? We can use the information we have about the points and substitute the coordinates of one of the points that lie on the line into the equation y equals mx plus c. We can choose to use either one of the points we have. Let's take the point with coordinates 3, 7. The x value is 3 and the y value is 7. So at this point on the line, we can say that 7 is equal to the m, which we know is 12 divided by 5, times the x value, which is 3, and still add the c, which we don't know yet. Do you see how this helps us? Yes, now we can find c. There's no other variables in the equation. Right, so let's write this fraction here as 7 and 1 -fifth first. To get c by itself, subtract 7 and 1 -fifth from both sides and we get minus 1 -fifth equals c. OK, so now we know what c is, but I don't know what to do with it. We were looking for the equation of this specific line. We have found the values of the m and the c for this line. So now, we just put those into y equals mx plus c. Oh, so we have y equals 12 divided by 5x minus 1 fifth. And that's it. Remember, your equation must keep the x and the y because they represent the changing points along the line. I think I get it. But can we go over the steps again? Sure. We began by writing down the general equation of a straight line. Remember, there are two values we must find in this equation. m, the gradient, and c, the y-intercept. To find the value of the gradient m, we can either calculate it using the formula or we can read it off the graph. To calculate the y-intercept or c value, we can substitute the coordinates of one of the points on the graph into the equation. Once we have found m and c, we just write down the final equation of the graph. Does that explain it for you? Yes, thanks. Good. Now there's one more thing I want to show you. Can you find the gradient of this line? Okay. 
I can see that the gradient is 3 units down and 3 units across. Does that mean that the gradient is 3 divided by 3? Be careful. Look at the slope of this line. This is not a positive slope. As the x values increase, the y values decrease. In a sense, we go downhill from the left to the right. Moving down by 3 gives you a negative 3. That means your gradient is... Negative. Okay, so the gradient isn't 1, it's negative 1. Right, and that's an important thing to watch out for. Always check whether your gradient is positive or negative. Now let's look at the angle of inclination of a line. This just means how much the line is inclined or sloped, in other words, at what angle it slopes. When we work with straight lines on the Cartesian plane, we define the angle of inclination as the one formed between the positive x-axis and the straight line. It is measured from the positive x-axis in an anti-clockwise direction. Have a look at this example. Here's a line that has the equation y equals 3x minus 6. The line intercepts the x-axis at 2. This angle of theta between the positive x-axis and the line is the angle of inclination. Can you see some way of working out how big angle theta is? I can see from the graph that it must be less than 90 degrees, but I can't be more accurate than that. Have a look at this. If I drop a perpendicular line from this point 4, 6 on the straight line down to the x-axis, I will form a right angle triangle. In this triangle, do we have some information that could help us to find the size of angle theta? That sounds more like trigonometry than coordinate geometry. You're right. It is trig. Remember that different parts of math link to each other all the time. Actually, in this triangle example, we use our knowledge of functions and algebra for the straight line. We use coordinate geometry and we use trigonometry. I like that. Let me label the triangle ABC. Now, will it help me to know these lengths, side AB and BC? Try it and see. From A to B is just two units. Then from B to C is six units. So now I guess I could use one of the trig ratios. Excellent. Here are the trig ratios. Sine, cosine, and ten of theta. Can you see which one will be useful to us? Okay. If I put my finger on the angle theta, we know the length of BC, which is opposite side, and AB, which is the adjacent side. So we can use 10 of theta. BC is 6, and AB is 2. So 10 theta is 3. All we have to do now is use the inverse 10 key on the calculator, and we get angle theta is equal to 71,57 degrees. In other words, the angle of inclination of our straight line is 71,57 degrees. That went well enough. But there's also something else happening. What is the gradient of the line that passes through A and C? It is the change in the y value, which is 6 units, divided by the difference in the x values, which is 2. So that makes the gradient 3. But that's exactly what the tan of theta was equal to. True. The tan of theta and the gradient of the line from A to C are exactly the same. So, if we know what the gradient of a line is, we can find the angle of inclination of that line. Can we do another one? Sure. Here's a line that joins the points 0, 3 and 3, 0. Okay. The gradient of line PQ is 3 down, so that's negative 3. And 3 across to the right, so that's a positive 3. So that comes to a negative 1. 10 theta is negative 1, so now I can find theta. Look carefully. Which angle are you referring to on the plane? Which angle is theta? Remember that the angle of inclination is always measured from the positive x-axis in an anti-clockwise direction. So, the angle we want will be here. It looks a bit bigger than 90 degrees. How do I work that out? You're right. It's an obtuse angle. You should remember from your trigonometry work that the tan ratio is negative for an obtuse angle. It makes sense because the slope of the line is also negative. Okay, so the tan of theta is negative 1. Do I just work that out on my calculator? Well, I'll try that. I get minus 45 degrees, but this angle isn't negative. Actually, this answer isn't wrong, but let me show you what you can do to get the positive angle. 
we can work out what the tan theta of 1 is first. Okay, so I take the inverse of tan of 1 on my calculator and I get 45. The obtuse angle we want is 180 degrees minus 45 degrees, which is 135 degrees. So the angle of inclination is 135 degrees. And we can check this by measuring with a protractor. But having said that, do not rely on a protractor. We need to be able to do these calculations. You're right. It is 135 degrees. So if the gradient of a line is negative, that means the inclination of the line is an obtuse angle. That's it. Let's look at what we've learned in this lesson. The equation of any straight line has the form y equals mx plus c. We can work out the equation of a line if we know the coordinates of two points on the line. We use them to find m, the gradient of the line. Then we substitute the coordinates of one of the points into the equation. This gives us the value of c. Then we discover that the gradient of a line is equal to tan of the angle of inclination of the line. So we can use the gradient to calculate the angle of inclination of a line. Our last example showed us that lines with a negative gradient will have an obtuse angle of inclination. Here's our task for today. P minus 2 minus 5 and Q 7 3 are points on a straight line. Find the equation of the line passing through the points and calculate the inclination of this line accurate to two decimal places. Okay, that's about all the time we have for today. I hope you learned something. Thanks. It's been great. But I really need to go now. No, it's okay. I'll see you next time.